Jake Casella, welcome to the Hey Sunshine podcast. Hey Shani, so nice to be here. Oh God, it's so good to have you here. Um, Now, I was kind of like thinking back to like the backstories of when we kind of first met and you were mm. kind of like orbiting in my circles and yeah. um. I'd, I'd love to kind of set the scene for the listeners to see kind of like how we sort of cross paths. And um, I think you just had Rumi. So you and yeah. your beautiful partner, Larissa, just had Rumi. And um, and you would float into the general store in this amazing kind of like, you know, that like poncho thing that you used to wear. Uh, you yeah. probably still wear it, but this yeah, is when yeah, I was yeah. working there. And like you would just like you'd have like Rumi under one arm. You were just working the room and like I was like, who is this Jedi human? And then, um, and then you know, I would see you at you know like different parties, and then you, I was like, and he's a DJ too. Like you were literally just this, you know, multifaceted human. And yeah, I'm I'm so thrilled to have you on the podcast today, talking about all the things. Yeah, um, it's so nice to be. But do you want to do, do you want to give everyone a kind of little like backstory on Jake and and what you do, your magic? Yeah, of course. And there's actually another piece to like us meeting. I don't know if yeah. you know. So, so okay. I'll, just, oh, God. I'll just add a little bit in. <laughs> I is, love it. I was actually chatting to one of the girls at, at the general store one day when you weren't there and I was talking about human design. Yeah. And they said like, oh, if you're into human design, you got to talk to Shani. Oh, and I God. was like, oh, <laughs> right. And then when I saw you um, at a party one, Arvo, then we like opened up that. I think that's where the, that's like it. where we were like, oh, okay, we get each other. We speak we get the same it. language. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. So give us yeah. your human design breakdown for anyone who's listening. Okay, cool. So I'm a four six manifester um, yeah. with the uh, emotional wave. Amazing. Oh god, the emotional waves. We all get each other, don't we? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's so absolutely. good. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, tell us a bit about like your work. You obviously do incredible one on one work, and you've created an incredible book, which we're going to dive into today as well. Yeah. Um. So. I, I really feel this is my life's work. It's it's really the only thing in life that I feel like I've been good at. Yeah, um, yeah definitely like school. School was a struggle for me and I got in a lot of trouble. Um, but one of the things like when I was a young boy that um, my mum used to say was, you're really good at talking, Jake. Like I was like, mum, that's not a good thing. Like I want to be good <laughs> at like, I want to be good at like, you know, the things that other kids are good at, like sports and like mm -hmm. different things in academia or art and stuff like that. I just didn't see it, you know? And um, I think that was where like a lot of my struggles began, just not feeling good, at, mm -hmm. good at things and not being able to get that external validation from things outside of myself. Um, and, and I guess that actually did lead me into finding this work because I, I kind of had my own struggles from, I think around, um, you know, eight, nine, 10, mm -hmm. um, all the way through to my twenties and, um, mostly struggling with, with, I guess what I'd call depression now, but lots of negative thinking, um, a lot of just, my mind wasn't a very good place to be all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, that was kind of a driving factor that got me into this work really. Yeah. Um, and I think now that I start, that I work with a lot of clients one-on-one, -on -one, I realize that every single person has this time in their life where, as for some of them, it's as a two-year-old, for some as a 10-year-old and some as a teenager, but where life is like, life is all light and mm. it's just like amazing and everything's great and we feel safe and supported. And then we realize that we don't actually have the resources to cope with how think, you know, things just, mm. we receive challenges that are bigger than we, we deem we can cope with yeah. and how we move through those experiences as kids, oh, it shapes us in, in huge ways huge mm. ways and um sometimes it feels like everything happens at once and that was my kind of experience lots of things happened at once I felt like I couldn't cope um and um and yeah and then I I thought you know being naughty became mm. kind of my identity so I got I got in a lot of, a lot yeah. of trouble because I got external validation from that um mm. but yeah um you know I kind of struggled through into my 20s and then I started um, I kind of had this choice point. Do I keep studying um, tourism? I was working mm -hmm. as a travel agent at the time um, and I was working in hospitality. I was like, or do I go study this thing that my mum does? And like, you know, I they never want to be like your parents, you yeah. know, like amazing, <laughs> right? But she's a social worker and she's like, I reckon you'd be really good at this. You know, you're so good at talking, connecting with people. And I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. all right, mum. So I kind of... um 
started looking into different um, degrees that I could do in the in the place of like social science, counseling, coaching. Mm. And I found this amazing degree and it was a degree in me, right? It was just like all about my personal and spiritual development. And I was going through oh. a, break to, uh, a breakup at the time um, and having a lot of really negative thoughts going on in my head. Mm. And um, yeah, it was kind of through that that I really knew um, as a like a young boy in my 20s, I was going to all these workshops with um, old female psychologists and stuff. I was definitely the odd one out in these rooms. And, uh, but I knew that I wanted to do this. I knew that I wanted to be in private practice. I wanted to be helping people one-on-one, um, that I really wanted to help people change their inner worlds. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I was on track to change mine. And I really did like, and I guess that's why I wrote a self-help book because self-help books are what helped me through Yeah. Um, yeah, I was obsessed with something called acceptance commitment therapy, which is a mindfulness based cognitive therapy. Right. Mm. And and I I got, I got obsessed with that early on and I went and did all the trainings and, um, I used that and exercise to really like heal my depression and, and start moving forward in my life. Um, and yeah, and I just always wanted to do that basically. Mm. Um, amazing. What what do you think yeah. were some of like the the biggest sort of game changing books in that self help uh, world that that really changed the game for you? For me, early on, I gotta say, like early on, um, I was I was rigid. I was very I was quite rigid and not too open to things that were like in the the realm of energy and when it mm. came to self help and stuff like that. And I think uni fed me this as well. It fed me that they have to be evidence-based peer reviewed yeah. models. So because of that, I kind of like looked at all the models that were out there and I rejected a lot of them mm. um, because I didn't, I tried them on myself. They didn't work. So I was like, all right, this is bullshit. Yeah. Um, and it was really this one acceptance and commitment therapy that I just became totally, I guess, even dogmatic about. I was obsessed mm. with it. It was the only thing that worked. Nothing else. Right. Did. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, I guess like uh, my North node in, in, um, astrology is, is Pisces, right? Mm. So like I started to move away from this idea of, um, of things being like rigid and having to be scientifically rigorous, et cetera, later yeah. on in life. Um, but back then it was really all the books around acceptance and commitment therapy. And there's one called the happiness trap. That's like a really good, easy read. Yeah. Um, and definitely I, I still believe that learning mindfulness is a the number one important skill if you, you, know, you need to be able to see what's going on in your mind to be able to change it so it starts mm. there but I realized that that in itself couldn't change things yeah um, and so then I went on to look at more yeah. um yeah, I love the contrast I yeah. like the contrast in like you being so dogmatic in this one sort of like practice yeah. and now like your you know the book you've um created and written Untriggered is like is drawn upon multiple different you know um philosophies and books and teachings and it's like yeah. you've gone from kind of being so in the micro to so in the macro and 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 drawing from all these different inspirations so can can you take us through like um maybe tell us about the book the book mm, um untriggered yeah. as well and then maybe go into like what was really like the inspiration behind it yeah yeah so untriggered is a self help book and it's a ten step method and mm. I really tried to keep it um as simple as possible and it's the method that I've been using with clients now for um at least three or four years mm. um and. I, it took me ages to get it into words and get it into a 10 step process. Cause it was just something that I was doing. Mm. Um, and, um, but I really, when I thought about everything that I was doing and, and like, how could I make biggest impact and biggest value and give something away very cheap or free that could really help people. It was this, it Amazing. was, it was this, this process. Um, I, I really believe now I believe that it's the kind of thing that like, I wish I had this book in my twenties when I was struggling. Mm. And I think that, I think that, that this can be taught in, this can be taught in schools. Um, you know, obviously like uh, chain, like, um, flexed in some certain ways, but I think it can be taught to kids. It can be taught in schools. The mm. underlying philosophy of it can be applied. It doesn't, um, it can be used with other approaches, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a really simple process and you can apply it yourself. And, yeah. um, one of the things I didn't like about the therapy world. So I kind of, I did two and a half years in 
uh, in therapy, uh, counseling, psychotherapy in my uni degree. But in the last mm-hmm. year, I went and specialized in coaching. One of the things I didn't like about um, the old school therapy approach is two things I didn't like. One was the idea that we could just talk about things and they would change because for yeah. me, talking about things didn't change them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the Freud thing is like make the unconscious conscious and you'll be free. And I'm like, well, it doesn't work like that. Mm-hmm. It didn't work like that for me anyway. Um, and yeah, that was the major thing. Um, second thing that slipped my mind, but I'm sure it will come back. I think it, like for me, I struggled with just, um, yeah, uh, pretty much as you said, talking about it and not actually clearing the subconscious like stories and patterns and programming that are keeping you in that loop. Like most yeah. of us, I would say, um, you know, have a conscious awareness of the, of the trigger or the problem, but it's like, what do we do about it? Like that's what I really struggled with talk therapy because I'm like, we're here talking about the same issue. If awareness was the key, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be still talking about the issue. So that's why I really love, there's so many parts of your process that I love. One, it's not about just talking about it. It's yes, creating awareness, but also getting to the subconscious root cause. Yes. And also like bringing the power back to the us, like, like we are our own healers, like, you know, there's such a um an outsourcing mentality of like oh I need I need you to heal me I need you to heal me but really like we're our own best healers and we know ourselves so much better than we can give credit for so yes. that's why I'm obsessed with this whole process because it's just it's flipping the script like we can yeah. heal ourselves yeah thank you that's the pe- that that's the bit that I was that's a bit that slipped yeah. my mind exactly that there bit <laughs> but yeah that um like the kind of therapy thing also of like building this dependence on a person Mm. having to see them for 12 months or longer I was like I don't believe this like I believe like short rapid change can happen if it's done in the right way in a really potent way Mm. um and I believe that we should be teaching skills and that there should be homework right and that we should change clients worldviews because their worldviews are shit Mm -hmm. right all these things that we're told like not to do um and, and I guess that led me to a to a process um that empowered people to become their own healers and their own coaches because stuff's going to come up for our whole lives Mm. and we need a process. And this, I believe, is the process that allows us to not go digging for stuff, but when stuff comes up, we know what to do with it. And, Mm. like, that's that's really the reason why I believe in it so deeply and that's the motivating factor to create this book. And it's so interesting when people go looking for stuff because I'm like, well, you're obviously just, you know, you're not looking in the right place. Like, you know, what's what's this um, Peter Crone always says? It's like life will always bring you people, places, circumstances to show you where you're not free. So Absolutely. it's like life is always communicating with us, you know, where we're playing small or limiting or, you know, um, not being our truest, most authentic self. So it's like if we're if we're actually responding to what's in front of us, like we can actually do the healing that's required. And that, yeah, this like I'm obsessed with this process <laughs> already. Um, So should we talk about what's a trigger? Because I find, mm. yeah, and we were having a chat about this, Jake, before we got on, having a little laugh because it triggers so like flippant these days. It's like, oh, he triggered me or she triggered me and, you know, oh, I'm triggered by this. And it's like, yeah. what does that actually mean to be triggered? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So... <laughs> You know, I, I use a lot of scaling in my session, right? Scale of mm-hmm. one to 10, scale of one to seven for some things. And if we think about this scale, one to 10, 10 is the nervous system being in complete overwhelm. Mm-hmm. Um, complete overwhelm, like, you know, everything's going, complete danger. And like zero is um, you're asleep at night, right? You know, and, and so... A trigger is when the nervous system has a little jump, right? It, it's kind of like activated and it kind of jumps up a, a couple of steps um, on that scale because of something that has happened in the environment. But it's actually not just what's happened in the environment. It's the way that we've perceived mm. what's happened in that environment. And I, what I see is that we experience a trigger, which is a nervous system activation. And with that, there are a whole range of things that happen for me, the heart beats and heat Mm. comes to my face. I get sweaty hands. Everyone's different tight throat. Um, definitely confusion and muddied mind. Yeah. Um, like on a physiological level, 
blood's pulled away from the prefrontal cortex, the logical part of the brain, left and right hemisphere Mm. are no longer talking to each other, logic and emotional and intuitive are no longer talking, little drawbridge comes up, the corpus callosum, and normally they'll get, will get fixated probably like on one of those sides of the brain. The, The blood is taken out to the limbs and it means the brain is not working uh, how it should work. It's not working mm. in, in optimum functioning, which means we can't think clearly. We might play out a subconscious program, which is a habitual way of thinking, feeling, or behaving based off what we've done in the past and what's worked. So it's like mm. playing out an old safety mechanism. Um, and and so like that's what a trigger is. It's when something happens in our environment um, and we perceive that for some reason or another, and it's usually a very unconscious mm. perceiving because we sometimes can even miss triggers if we're not paying attention, but it's a little flicker of the nervous system. And when the nervous system flickers a little bit, there's always something there. So like yeah. when I'm doing work with clients, I'm saying to them, sometimes I notice, like I can see on their face or I can feel energetically, even over Zoom, mm. that something's happened for them. And I'm like, as soon as I, as soon as that happens, I say to them, take the whole brain posture, right? Take the what? Um, The whole brain? The whole brain posture. I'll I'll show you this in a little moment. Um, It's a, it's a, it's a way to create nervous system safety and it's how we Mm. begin the emotional processing technique. And my clients know that like, I'm going to stop them sometimes and say, take the whole brain posture. Right. Mm. Um, And that means like, let's go, we're going into this right now. Okay. Um, let, let me show you that. Pro, let me show you that yeah. right now. We're, we're here, right? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, just, just to feel what it feels like. Um, and so, obviously, a bit easier described because you can see me on video. But for those listening on audio, I'll try to make it really simple. Yeah. Um, the first thing you do is you just cross your ankles, left over right, or right over left. Um, you can also sit cross-legged. Mm. Um, what's funny is that if you're ever like at a dinner table and the conversation gets a bit weird, and um, and you start to feel a bit uncomfortable, very naturally we cross our we cross our, our ankles over. Yeah. Um, and it's very normal. And also people also do the next part of it, which is they cross their arms. I see people mm. doing this in, in all different places, but there's a few yeah. different ways to cross the arms. You can just cross them um, over the chest um, and kind of have one hand on each shoulder. But the, the, and, and you can also like tap left, right. Now they use this in EMDR. Mm. Um, to create whole brain the way that I was taught, but it does the same thing. Um, you cannot, yeah, you can also put hands on knees and tap left, right. But the way that I was taught comes from something called Psych K. Um, and Psych K borrowed that from something called Brain Gym. So everything's always being borrowed. Yeah. Um, and I can show you this on video. It might be hard for people to understand, but essentially, your little fingers, this is how I, I teach it the little fingers and the hands come and cross over. So both of your little fingers are kind of touching uh left over right or right over left yeah and and then you actually interlock your fingers and you can put your hands down uh in your lap or you can give yourself a little cuddle Mm. um and i've got it like you can see this a video of this it's it's in my book um if if you can't see it right now i'm sure we'll share it somewhere so you can can put in the show notes (laughs) beautiful yeah Yeah. and and so just like close your eyes for a little moment just notice Mm. what it feels like so just take a few mindful breaths in the whole brain posture. It definitely it feels quite grounding because I have my mm. hands on my heart. Mm. And this is just yeah. a little a little nervous system trick, and they've done um, some like sort of kind of studies in neuroscience, and like a lot of things, we don't really know why things work. If you look mm. at any of the like, if you look at um, tapping EMDR, any of the like kind of transformation processes that are super powerful, they still don't really know. There's like assumptions mm. for why things work, but we don't really know why things work. But what they can see from brain imaging is that this calms the nervous system down and it helps both left and right hemisphere of the brain to communicate. So you've got both logic and mm. emotion. Um, That's cool. Yeah. I've seen something this, similar yeah. with the with the figure eight. Is that also a similar? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, and so, like in my book, step one is safety. Yeah. Right. And what this does is it creates it creates safety in the nervous system for someone because we can't let go or process a trigger. Mm. 
mm. um, or even really let ourselves feel our feelings. We'll just push them down um, unless we feel safe. And we have to feel safe in the nervous system. We need to feel safe in the environment. That's like usually no one's in the house. You're in yeah. a private place where you don't feel like you're going to be judged or you're in a car somewhere, you know, like in a park and you don't feel like anyone's watching or listening. Mm. Um really really important to create that safety and then on a mental level we have to feel safe that feeling our feelings is not going to bring about episodes of poor mental yeah. health right and some people have that belief and so I spend time on that with them before we can get anywhere near the process mm. some clients can move from step one into step two uh in seconds and it's taken me six months for some clients to move wow through step one and I really see that that is like those that have experienced a lot of trauma and have a lot of stuff around safety. Mm. Um, we need to do heaps of work on safety, step one, before I can move forward yeah. um, to do the rest of this process. Um, so how would you know? So say if you're doing this process at home, how would you know, Jake, if if you've passed, you know, the safety level, if you're doing it by yourself? Yeah. Um, really, like, if you feel, if you feel safe, mm. Um, if you, and if, and like, essentially, if there's no one home, you're in a private place, you don't feel listened to or judged, yeah. um, you, and you take the whole brain posture and you close your eyes, it's normally enough safety to be able to feel, be able to feel what's there. But if you find that you're trying to do the emotional processing technique, which is the book, which is the technique, uh, from the book mm. and it's not working for you, it's always safety. Yeah. Um, I also have been through stages in my life where it hasn't worked for me. And I'm like, why is it not working? Mm. And it's because I've felt rushed. So like, I've felt like having a little while I need to get back. I don't know. Like I just got a few minutes to do this. It doesn't work. Like yeah. you need to like give yourself all the space to know that when the emotions and when everything comes up that you can do the whole thing and you don't feel rushed. So there's also mm. this time safety thing which I only realized more recently, um, yeah. beautiful timing. Cause I could add that in, um, add that into the book. So 100%. not fun yeah. when you have a kid and you're like, but I've got to do the process. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And, or even if you think you have other things that are more important yeah. to do, right? Like, mm. yeah. yeah. That's awesome. And then, so should, do you want to go through the steps? Do you think that'd be the best thing to do or, or what do you yeah. think is best? I'll, I'll, I'll explain. Um, yeah. I'll explain, explain some of the steps a little bit. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the first step is is safety, yeah. um, as, as we've talked about. And the next step is intention. And that's simply like, just like, what are we doing here? It doesn't mm. have to be all like, doesn't have to be all like deep and philosophical, but just like, what are we doing here? Um, you know, my intention is to feel and release all the emotional stuff that came up before so that I can move forward in my life and feel happier and more free. Like it doesn't mm. really matter, but I think it's always important just to find what you're doing in any mm. kind of healing, in any kind of healing work, just kind of like speak out, set a declaration, say what you're about to do. Yeah. Um, step three is a check-in and, and this is using that scale of one to 10. Um, when you bring the trigger to mind, um, how, much as it activate your nervous system now mm. being a few days later or a few hours later, or even a few weeks later, um, that gives you an indication of how well processed it is. Because if you stay low on that scale, then you effectively process the trigger and you probably don't need to use this, this technique. Yeah. But if it does activate the nervous system, then absolutely there's something here for you to, to sit with. It gives you a starting point, the check-in so that mm. at the end you can see, has this worked for me? Have I changed? And we, we really need that as humans. Um, yeah, it's like a benchmark kind of sort of thing. Yeah. 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 Cool. Um, in step three, we also identify and name the associated emotions present because mm -hmm. there's been studies that um, show that when we're able to name the emotions that sit underneath an experience, it actually helps everything to mm. start regulating and helps us to let go. Um, funny thing, I was speaking to a, a client yesterday who said, um, it was a potential client and um, they said that they found it really hard to name the the emotions mm. that were going on. Um, and I said, that's completely okay and completely normal. And this is again, why I like, I love teaching this stuff to kids and in schools and stuff is because yeah. you can teach children to like name associated emotions and stuff. And so many adults mm. 
just have never had that. I've never had any time spent on like, what is the emotion underneath this? Totally. Um, yeah. and because in the English language, we say the word feelings, right? I feel this way, but we use that word in the wrong context. So mm. often we say, um, we say, I feel like I'm being judged, right? Or I feel like um, you don't love me. Or mm. I feel like, um, I feel like everyone's laughing at me, right? And that's not an emotion. It's not a feeling either. Yeah. We should actually, we should like, I wish we could get rid of that because mm. we don't feel like that. We think it's a, it's a we're, yeah, we yeah. think that that's what's happening. People can identify those things really easy. Mm. So I just get them to start with that. I ask them what, what's the feeling or emotion. They give me a, a judgment of the situation. And then I say, okay, and what's under that? And we normally find what the emotions are. And there's usually between two and four that sit mm. underneath each trigger for some reason there's somewhere between two and four um, mm. that sit under a triggering event and um the next step step four and maybe that's as, as far as i'll we'll take it today yeah we might even give we might even we might even give this little a little practice step yeah, four cool. is actually processing the trigger so that's just mm. um that's actually now that we feel safe and we're in whole brain posture we actually go back and we we re-experience the whole event Mm. Um, and we, this time we let ourselves, um, feel the emotions and they will hit a peak and feel incredibly uncomfortable, but we stay with it for up to two or three minutes yeah. until the body naturally starts to bring the nervous system back into an integrated state. And it, it literally takes less than three minutes for each mm. used to say two, but I'm noticing some people take a little longer, but somewhere between two and three minutes. For each emotion, now there might be there might be somewhere between two and four emotions underneath each trigger, so they might ride a few waves, um, but it only takes a few minutes for them to fully experience it, and they might cry or shake or feel like very angry or go hot or red mm. or something might happen, um, and then the whole the nervous system will on its own bring them down, and they'll feel really like tired, calm, peaceful. Um, and mindful mm. and then what i've noticed happens is they just they either jump to another one automatically and if they haven't i'll just cue them to the next ones that sit underneath it and that's step four it's processing the trigger um mm. the rest of the steps i'll just like <clears throat> sum up quickly is we actually from that place of understanding the trigger we use that data to go back to any other time in your mm. life where a similar event has happened that has reinforced or strengthened or added some kind of pain or opened up an old wound and kind of poked it again um, because it's not the, and we go all the way back, right? We go all the way back through your timeline. So we do a reverse timeline. We go back in chronology, in reverse chronological order through your life and your body, anytime the mm. body gets triggered again and activated again, we're like, oh, that hasn't been processed. Yeah. We stay here and we go back again. And sometimes people will, will see things, but they won't have anything going on. They've already processed that. They don't mm. need to do anything for whatever reason. They've been able to move through it. Um, maybe they felt safe or they had support from someone at that stage or they, you know, whatever, they, they were able to do it. And then there's mm. other things that they weren't because they were rushed or they didn't feel safe or they felt judged or they weren't allowed to or they have stories about what that emotion or whatever means in their family or culture or whatever yeah. right so and it's the idea all the way to, back yeah i was going to say you're going yeah. back to like the core the core you know principal moment yeah yeah and yeah. that this is an important mm. thing too i don't i don't believe there is one core or one root mm. but i believe in roots and I'll, and I'll tell you why because the first time something happens to us in our life um as a kid right um usually the first time we feel rejected um or we feel um, let's just say with rejection, right? First time we feel rejected, we kind of think, well, it's a coincidence. So it just happens like, you know, mm. it wasn't a big deal. Um, it, it hurt, but like, it, it, you know, it was probably because that person or whatever and like, whatever, we don't make it mean too much about us. But the second time it happens, we're like, oh, that hurt just like the other thing hurt. It really hurts mm. this time, you know, it's really been poked again. It's the third time and the fourth time and the fifth time yeah. that um, they're some of the most painful and big ones 
to process with people as adults mm. because that's when we made it mean something about us, others, and the world. The world yeah. is a dangerous place. Mm. Um, you know, like things like that. The world's a dangerous place and I can't trust that um, I can support myself and I can't, yeah. don't feel supported by my parents, right? Like, wow, okay, now, mm. we've got an, now we've got an assumption about ourselves, others, and the world. And that assumption, um, from that assumption, we create agreements and agreements yeah. are how I'm going to act. So like, so for be- the best way for me to act is to um, pull back, not shine bright, um, you know, Be do whatever we need. Or do this. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. Right. Mm. Um, and then we repeat those patterns because if mm-hmm. they work, if they work and they do keep us safe, it kind of gives us that reward that it worked yeah. and we repeat them and we repeat them, we repeat them, we repeat them, we repeat them mm. and they become a habit, they become subconscious, but eventually they stop working, but they're now a habit. Yeah, and, and it's part just, of us really. Right, yeah. yeah, right. It's funny like both ways evidence really is the thing. So at the start it's the it's the um, re- repetition of the events that build the evidence to then kind of create the trigger but then, like, it, it's also like the um, the evidence of if I keep shutting myself off, I feel safer. If I keep dimming my light, I feel safer until we, until we ha- we're ready to break the cycle. Like, it's this, we, it's Sorry. like catch 22, really. Yeah. 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 We end up in a rock bottom because mm. the, the, the old strategy, um, it starts having negative byproducts. Mm. And when those negative byproducts are so much that we end up, you know, like a bit of a rock bottom, then we often feel motivated to change them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's simply why I think this process is so powerful because whatever shows up for us in life, um, it shows us something from our past. And I believe that's always saying, you're ready. You're ready Mm. to work on this. It's come up because you're ready. And it's like, hey, shiny. Are you, are you ready to process it it's this like, time? Let's do the work. Yeah. 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 Or, or <laughs> totally. no. No. Yeah. Okay. Well, it'll come back again in a few weeks or months or years and you get yeah. another opportunity. So you, you never, you never lost. Mm. Um, you, you never, you know, but that's why I think it's important to tool people up and give them skills. And that's why I love being a teacher and a coach and a therapist. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to have mm. all those hats. And it's people. so like, imagine if kids were empowered with this, you know, 10 step or it's a simplified version of this just to even be like oh hang on I'm feeling something right now this is intense like I can actually do something about it I'm not a victim of you know this circumstance and and I can really change like my path like that is just so empowering absolutely yeah you know that only need the first four steps Mm. because if we actually felt if we could create safety and feel what we were feeling in any given moment we wouldn't need to do the rest of the steps that go into like the history and going yeah. back and all that stuff because there wouldn't be any. No, um, <laughs> we'll be clean yeah. vessels. So much right. simpler. Right. Yeah, but it's so interesting what you said before, Jake, about like not really knowing the emotions that's going on. Like, so this mm. morning I was filling up the kettle and you know I've been sick this week and I feel like I've just been a bit off and and I was I I just my brain kept on saying to myself like I feel weird, and then and then. And I just kept on repeating it. And then I was like, but why do I feel weird? You know, like, what, like, is weird an emotion? No, it's, 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 a, it's a judgment of the situation that I do feel yeah. weird. I feel off. Yeah. And then I'm kind of like, I just stopped. And I like, this is like a real relearning pattern. Cause I've always been yeah. one. I'm like, no, suppress, suppress, suppress. Like we'll, mm. we'll get through this or whatever. Mm. But I was like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to just like be with it. So I just like put my hand on my heart and I was like, like, what am I feeling? And then I think um, the word like apprehension came up. I don't even know if that's, if that's a feeling, but I was, but I was, I was just like, yeah, I'm, fe- I'm feeling apprehensive about today, you know? And I was like, oh, isn't that so much nicer to kind of sit with that rather than weird? Because weird is kind of, I've labeled it as bad, but I'm like, it's actually, it's not a bad emotion. It's just a different emotion to what I'm you know, um, saying is acceptable for me to experience. But it was just like just that one, like, you know, probably 45 seconds to a minute of just pattern interrupt, be like, hang on, I'm going to sit with this. Yeah. Just completely changed it. I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm not feeling weird. I'm just apprehensive. Cool. Let's, let's get on with it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. 
imagined. We just do this with if all children knew how to do this. Mm. Um, you know, if all thirty year olds bloody knew how to do it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And absolutely. And um, yeah. Often stuff comes up in relationships, right? Mm. Like it, it doesn't matter. It could be romantic or often it comes up with another person. They can be the mirror that makes us feel this stuff. I mean, in your situation this morning, not. It was just there's something going on for me. But, um, yeah, I, relationships function much better if two people can go away and be like, well, that's what's going on for me. Okay, cool. Come back. Yeah. This is yeah. what's happening, right? Totally. And it's so like, cause obviously Blake, my partner's super into the work and everything as well. And, you know, sometimes I'll go to him and be like, I'm just feeling really anxious today. And he's like, thanks for sharing. And I'm like, cool. You know, and it doesn't need to mean anything. It's just, it's, it's almost having the other person aware of where you're at and, and yeah. how you're feeling in that day is sometimes all you need. And, and, and I'd love to share, like, this is kind of um, the trigger that came up the other day. And um, so he he said something to me. He said, oh, like, um, I said, I'm feeling really good at the moment. And he's like, yeah, you're looking really good. And I go, yeah. And he goes, you're kind of looking like the smallest that I've ever seen you. And I'm like, yeah. And then, and then it was like in that moment, like the trigger came and I was like, but last time I was the smallest that I've ever been, you know, this bad thing happened. And then it was like the trigger, um, it almost like went on this whole doom sort of uh, what do you mean, doom forecasting thing of this one event and um and and do you know what just verbalized I said I stopped and I verbalized it to him and I just said you know what like this is exactly what came up for me just then and I and I spoke through the whole thing and I was like that even just processing it out loud just make me feel so much better and it's kind of like getting it out of your head but Absolutely. um yeah, so I don't, I don't even know where that comes into the to the ten step process. Probably processing the the trigger. Absolutely, yeah. We, yeah. we would always we would always start with the trigger. Do you yeah. want to do you want to do that right now? Yeah, do let's do it. it. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, like just quickly, like what's the intention? Um, mm. what's the intention? Like, what? Why do we want to? Why do we want to like go back and rehash this? Why do you want to rehash it? How do you want to feel different? I want to rewrite the story uh, that being at my at my fittest, my leanest, my healthiest doesn't mean I'm about to go backwards. Like that, that's kind of been the narrative is as soon as I get to that point, something will happen. So in the past I've gotten really sick or, yeah. you know, um, I've gotten parasites or like there'll be, there'll be something really big that happens. So yesterday in that moment, I kind of was like, I can feel self sabotage almost like brewing. Yeah, right. So you don't, you don't want your. Uh, what I'm hearing is that you don't want your, you don't want your nervous system and your subconscious to think that that's dangerous. Yeah, yeah. And exactly. then to start employing protection strategies. Yeah, which is really what sabotage is, right? Protection strategies um, that might mm. have a negative repercussions. Is that totally. right? Totally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. And um, and instead you. Instead, you want to what stay in a grounded space, I guess. How do you want to be? In, how do you want to just want to enjoy, like you know? Yeah, I think I just want to enjoy where I'm at, and it's like not have um, almost this, yeah, self sabotage mindset sort of come in. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, just enjoy enjoy where I'm at, enjoy life. <laughs> okay, all right, beautiful. Yeah. Um, and so, like, where you are right now. Obviously, mm. we're recording a podcast, but do, yeah. you feel, do you feel safe <laughs> enough with your listeners I, I and do. with where you are to have a little feel into this? Yeah, okay. I do. I do. Um, and, Thanks, and listeners, for coming along on the journey. <laughs> yeah, and and we don't. Um, we actually don't need to talk about this. Isn't a talking about process? It's actually a re-experiencing process. Mm. And I never, very rarely, unless clients want to share. I never get them to retell the story of what kind of happened. We just don't have time for it. We move on to more important things. It's yeah. not actually a thing anymore after we've done it. Um, okay, cool. Um, so we kind of know that you feel safe. We've kind of set that intention. Well, let's just do a little check-in. So mm. um, if you just close your eyes for a moment and just go back over, um, the like remember what happened before he said that yeah. um, and where you were and just just go back over it again. As in, in the scale. moment yesterday? Exactly. Yeah. And at the mo- I, I always say to go back to the moments leading up to it because mm. you would have been in a more neutral nervous system state. And then just let yourself kind of notice what happened, what was said. And while you just kind of dwell on it for a moment or two, just notice scale of 1 to 10, 
How does it activate your nervous system now when you think over it again? As in the moment before, not the actual. No, no, the actual yeah. moment. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like I can feel it in my throat. It's like an eight. <laughs> okay, so it's still yeah, it's still strong. And what that shows is that um, there's definitely some more processing to do mm. there. Um, and because we're we're not going to go back and do the whole historical timeline today, we kind of agreed that agreed yeah. on that before we jumped on. Um, I don't expect that we're going to get you down to like a one or a two. And I think that when we do the whole timeline, we might, but we're, we're, I think we're going to move the needle. I feel confident that we can move the needle a little bit on this for you. Cool. Um, see if you can identify the emotions present. You kind of already told me a bit about what some of the emotions were, but just see mm. if you can, if you can name, and if you can't name them, just tell me the judgment of the situation. Yeah. So definitely a lot of fear coming up. Yeah. Um, it's more of a judgment, but like there's a superstition. Um, mm-hmm. It's almost like a dread, like a dread, a deep yeah. dread coming up of like, oh, yeah. what if I have to go down that path again or have to experience that again or lose what I have? Like it's, yeah. um, I think, yeah, coming back to fear. Yeah, it's fear and it's mm. dread. Yeah. Is there anything else there? I think a lot of like uh, anxiety. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. So you're ready. So just um, cross your ankles, cross your hands, take the whole brain posture. Like a pretzel. Yeah, you got <laughs> it. Beautiful. Mm. Right, now go back again to the moments leading up to what was said yesterday. Just notice where you were. You're going to go slower over it this time. Notice where you were and what the temperature was like and when you're ready, just slowly go through the experience again. Notice what was said. But this time, give yourself full permission to feel and let your nervous system react mm. and actually allow this trigger to get really strong and hit a peak. Okay. And after it hits a peak, I want you to let it naturally dissipate on its own. And when you feel like your nervous system is steady again, I want you just to give me a nod. There is no rush. Can I verbalize a little bit of what's going on for me? Not yet. I want okay. you just to I want you just to <laughs> I want you just to feel it and we'll definitely talk yeah. about it after. Okay, just stay for a couple more moments now and just enjoy what it feels like to have your nervous system back in a regulated place again. Sometimes little bits of wisdom pop in now, so just take like 10 more seconds quiet. Mm. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Maybe just stay in the whole brain posture as you talk through what happened because mm. a bit more processing might continue to happen. It's good to to feel safe while you do that. Totally. Um, so I went back obviously to the moment in the kitchen with Blake and um, when I let myself kind of go to the extreme of the trigger, I just, I felt myself going, what if, what if, what if, like all of these possible scenarios. But then my, t- my tone kind of changed. So it went from kind of like doomsday what if to like, but what if, like, you know, like what if, what if could be a positive what if. So it kind of, it flipped the script in being like you get to choose the what if, like who who says that this means that, you know, something bad's going to happen. It could mean something amazing is going to happen, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was kind of cool just to realise I get to choose the what if. I get to choose the narrative. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. That's very normal um, yeah. is we, after we, there's nothing that helps me to know when we've effectively processed 
a, a, you know, a part of the trigger is that we see that we see a different perspective. Mm. We feel removed or far away from, or we yeah. can see it different in, in a way. Um, it's really normal to want to logic over the top of our emotions. And often, um, like I had to say, no, just keep feeling it. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a kind of a strategy to, to quash and make them go down because it's starting to feel quite uncomfortable. Mm. Um, that, and people do this like so often they want to talk about because we've, we've, we've learned to do that um, rather than just feel, right? Yeah. Um, did you notice um, as like as it started to peak and it started to come up towards where it was starting to feel uncomfortable, was there any part of you that, decided I don't want to feel this I'll just push it back or did you feel quite open to letting Mm. it come up and and get strong I kind of have this weird thing and it happens in like you know journeys a lot I'm like I just may as well go there now Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. while I'm clearing things now obviously Um, I may as well go there now and um it's so I don't have to do it later so yeah Yeah. so I was just like I'm like let's just let's just go yeah but it's um you know in in a lot of sort of coaching circles it's like going to the worst case scenario in a safe environment and realizing that it's not bad and that you know nothing like there's no end of the world or whatever mm-hmm. like it, it almost like quashes it in your mind you're like oh okay it's not as bad as I thought you know yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I love that. Beautiful. Thank you. So, How funny that that popped up yesterday as well. I was like, okay, obviously this is happening for always, a reason. Always, always. Yeah. Mm. And look, um, you know, if we had the time space um, and it was the right environment, yeah. I would want to understand, like, I'd want to go back and look at the series of events in your life, all the stories and sense mm. that you've made around other experiences, yeah, especially yeah. especially all the other pieces that make you feel like that's really dangerous. So um, mm. what we've done just now today is like I think about a soft drink bottle and, you know, you shake it up and it gets a lot of pressure. And when you open a little bit like, shh, and you let a little yeah. bit of it out, we've just done that. We've just like let a little bit of that pressure out. Um, we definitely haven't diffused all the pressure in the bottle around that event, um, but we've at least let some out and that's better mm. than, than not doing it at all because it will kind of come out eventually in some way. At least this is a yeah. healthy start to that. So um, <laughs> thanks for being um, courageous and vulnerable. Oh, my God. I know that was I, – I, like, have this thing where I'm like I hate silence, so I'm like, um, can I talk about what I'm going through right now? <laughs> so, yeah. no, that was good. Yeah. And thank you for the listeners for letting me get vulnerable on this as well. Um but I realized, Jake, I didn't even get to ask you my opening question, which I oh, yeah. absolutely love. So can I finish with the please, opening question? <laughs> please. Um, so what what is magic to you? What is magic to me? Mm. Mm. I'm still figuring that out. Good. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still figuring <laughs> I'm still figuring that out. But um mm. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's picking up on um, cues, you know, cues within ourselves, within others, within the universe. Mm-hmm. It's knowing when things are kind. Of, yeah, it's like just knowing when things are in flow, mm-hmm. um, and knowing how to flow with that. It's definitely something that I'm yeah. still. Um, learning and maybe it's um maybe it's personal for each person but I think I'm starting to uncover more about my magic and the way for me to um yeah really really use that mm. like and to tap into the magic that's that's kind of like all around it's the unseen it's the energetic totally. it's, the in, it's the invisible um And what I do love about that realm is that it can be impacted by thought alone. Mm. With like things that are more tangible, we don't yet know on planet Earth that we can just change things with our mind. But in the Mm. energetic realm, we can. And that's why I love setting intentions um, and, yeah, and like using our mind to create magic Mm, that's so cool 100 percent. that is magic (laughs) 
We've been doing this thing recently where we're like, we're asking for the signs and I've gotten Blake involved. I've gotten Janora involved. And I'm like, like, that's pure magic in itself. Like you're literally, you know, manifesting these things into reality and like yeah. seeing it. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's so cool. I just, I love the lens of magic because it's not something we often speak about. It's like, it's mm. science or it's this, but it's like mm. magic is just as real. Like yeah. we just got to be looking for it. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. With this, with the science thing, I, I get my clients to do this thing where they, they write their own science. Cause I'm like, mm. you know, 11, 11, because you know, whatever someone on Instagram says, it means this it doesn't mean that. What yeah. does it mean to you? Right. Mm. And a lady beetle and I like, whatever, like you create your signs. Yeah. And then when they are received, you know what they mean. Like yeah. don't let outside stuff create those signs. For you yeah it's like your own like sign dictionary that's yeah, like oh yeah. yeah now I saw a ladybug and yeah that's so cool yeah absolutely so tell us Jake how can people get in your world how can they work with you how can they purchase the book Untriggered yeah so the first four chapters of the book are free so um you can get them uh on Instagram by my link in bio mm-hmm. um the full book is 10 Australian dollars. So it's so uh, good. It's it, a bargain. <laughs> I've kept it super cheap. It's um it's at the moment it's in PDF. I'm gonna be um recording the audio book later this month. And I'll think about print at some stage. I mean, there's more and more people telling me that they really value print and really want it. Mm. Myself, print just sits on my bookshelf and it's like a nice thing to have. So um, I'm just trying to understand whether I, I'm going to go down that road, but um, yeah. yeah, so that's, that's, um, and with the full version of the book, you're going to get a audio recording that goes through the entire process and you basically just cool. pause it um, to do each step. And then you just press play again to keep going. Um, and there's a couple of like videos and there's access to it, you know, a few other little like learnings and things there. So um, you can just, and that's only available through me. It's yeah. not, it's not, um, you know, it's not even on my website yet. So really like via my Instagram is, is the number one place to get that right now. Um, and then in terms of working with me, um, I am realizing more and more that there's just, is this so much Aquarius in me and like not being able to follow any rules whatsoever and yeah. the way that I have <laughs> to create my own way of doing things. Um, the way that I do coaching and therapy uh, it, it doesn't look like the way that anyone else does it. Um, but for some people, it's, 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 it's exactly what they need and it's perfect. There's mm. a, there's a video that I created that kind of explains the way that I work. Um, like I, I do an eight week minimum, a 16 week maximum um, with people. Um, and so it's always one-on-one um, and there's a combination of both dependence and independence so there's Mm. like a a phase that I let them be really dependent on me and there's a phase where I create independence within them and we say "Mm, what stuff comes up here like yeah does the the independence phase bring up rejection and things like that great that's what we're here to do like let's let's like go with this Mm. um yeah I, I I love fusing coaching and therapy together I really believe that no good coaching happens without therapy and no good therapy happens without coaching Mm. um we're kind of taught that we're not supposed to fuse them but I find that that's what really helps people to make big changes in their world 100% um so in terms of working with me you can book in a free mini session um that's 30 minutes where we dive into one of the biggest issues that's happening in your world um, there's no obligation for that to be anything more than a gift from me to you to help you to move forward in your life. Mm. Um, and and then if off the back of that it feels like you want to do some work with me, um, you can reach out and we can organise what all that looks like. Um, so cool. But, yeah, all those details are in my link in bio. Amazing. Instagram. And I can pop them in the show notes as well. So you'll yeah. have them in your hot hot little hands. Yeah, beautiful. Amazing. And, yeah, the handle is... Um, I am the mindful coach. Amazing. I can pop that in the show notes too. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, Jake. And that was so cool to just run through the process. And obviously we only like just scratched the surface on the whole 10 mm-hmm. step process. I think we got to step four, but mm-hmm. so nice for people and, and me to experience what it's like. And yeah, just congrats again for just creating such an awesome, you know, gift to the world, really. It's amazing. 
Thank you, Shani. So beautiful to be here with you today, Spin, this morning. Good. Thanks for being vulnerable and opening up. uh, (laughs) Yeah, we'll connect again soon, I'm sure. Sounds good. And to everyone who's listening, thank you, thank you, and we'll see you on the next episode.